the 25th show focused on Brookline as an age-friendly community. In 2012, the World Health Organization of the United Nations designated Brookline its first age-friendly city in New England. This was the result of the work of the town select board, town departments, town residents, and a volunteer organization, <coughs> Brookline Can, that focuses on issues for residents of all ages. Today we have Roger Blood, the chair of the Housing Advisory Board of Brookline, and the subject is affordable housing in Brookline. Roger has been 25 years he spent on the Housing Advisory Board and working with the Affordable Housing Trust Fund that they control. He's also the Zoning Bylaw Committee. Since it was formed, he's been on that committee. And he's now working with the Town Negotiating Committee, working with the Newberry uh, Campus site. And they also are associated with an affor affordable housing opportunity. Roger was an independent consultant, and he worked with the World Bank and other international housing finance organizations. His assignments on affordable housing were involved with 20 countries, including the United States. He got his AB in economics at Clark University and his MBA in, uh, from the Wharton graduate, Wharton graduate uh, division of the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome, Roger. Thanks for having me, Matt. Well, it's timely. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, can I call it the HAB, or is it the... You certainly can. Okay. The, uh, the HAB itself works with affordable housing. What's the relationship with other groups? I've run into three or four recently that all say they're somehow associated with doing something with affordable housing. Uh, what, what's the relationship? Well, there, there are several, and there's several uh, welcome new ones, as, 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 as you know, Matt. Um, the, the Housing Advisory Board goes back uh, 30 plus years. It's, it's uh, one of many boards and commissions in the town that deal with various specialized subjects. Uh, there's many under the auspices of the planning department, which is where we're more or less nested along with the planning board okay. and others. Um, there's, of course, the Brookline Housing Authority, which um, handles a large number of uh, lower income rental units. But okay. that, unlike the HAB, it's not part of the town government. Um, there is an entity known as the BIC, Brookline Impl Improvement Coalition, which is a, a community development corporation that's... Has, they has actually do development. They they, uh, their, their mission is, is development, yes. And then there are a couple of citizens groups uh, that, have, uh, that, that have emerged that are, yeah. that are uh, good advocates and supporters for affordable housing, including um, one known as Housing Justice, that's uh, an organization with uh, four of the local uh, synagogues involved and oh, also... Okay. Um, Brookline for Everyone, uh, another housing, n newer housing advocacy group. Right, right. Yeah, I met the, actually I met the guy from Brookline, uh, Brookline for Everyone, and uh, uh, they had an organization, a meeting. And the Housing Justice, I know that, I know someone, uh, someone involved with that. That's what was, I, I see all these organizations, and I'm sure you're going to get into some of this later. There's, um, yeah, there's a, a real groundswell of interest in affordable housing because uh, clearly most people are aware a, a great shortage of affordable housing. Um, we're, we're benefiting from this huge prosperity and job growth in greater Boston. And but there are things happening now, too, aren't there? I mean, it's not... At one time, I think it was just talk. Now I, I have the feeling that there's at least activities and actual actual buildings and things like that. So will you get into that later, too? Well, we'll talk about that some more. There's been, um, there's been a lot that's been happening at a fairly low, steady level in, right. in Brookline. And, and as you'll see, we'll there are, there are challenges as well as opportunities in that regard. Great. And, okay, the show is about older adults to some extent. Right. So what, what about older adults and affordable housing? What relationship, what does that mean? Well, there's, um, there, there's often two kinds of needs as, as people think about the, the world of affordable housing. Uh, right. and, and, and I'm not referring to rental and owner, which is another way of dividing that world, but rather uh, uh, senior housing or known as age-restricted right. housing versus... Um, what is the age, by the way? Well, the, the standard uh, formal age for senior housing uh, is 62 and over. There's okay. something else that we might call senior housing light, which is when you have at least one person that's over 55 in your house. I uh, saw that one out in uh, Sudbury, I think. It was, a, it was a group, and I said, senior? You know, it was like, 
55, right, they said. Well, the AARP says, welcome to seniorhood when you're 50. Yeah, you know, so. <laughs> <It's good. laughs> to me, they're youngsters, but that's all right. right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, what you, oh, the other thing was the accessory dwelling. That's the right. thing I've been meaning to ask you, mm -hmm. because um, I, it, it, it got passed, right? Yes, okay. yes. Okay, what is that? Accessory dwelling units are something that is, um, has been uh, sought after. We've sought after it in Brookline for many years, and, and, and you're right, Matt, it just got passed by town meeting uh, um, in the, in the what, this past fall. Yeah. And it's for um, any owner, but mainly for uh, seniors who have owned their homes for a long time and they want to age in place. Okay. Some aging seniors do want to do that. Others want to give up their home and go into right. a more social environment. Um, which we'll, we'll talk a little about too. And um, accessory dwelling units are legalizing or are making legal uh, in single family housing and, and those zones what hasn't been permitted before and that is adding a small or accessory right. second dwelling unit um, in your home, either um, I I in the existing home or possibly converting a, a garage. Right. Um, there's, there's quite a few restrictions on that that uh, make them different than just a two-family house. These restrictions are just Brookline restrictions. This is a... Well, this is something that's been moving all over the country and all over greater Boston. Okay. And, um, but they, the commonality is, uh, yes, they're restricted often with regard to the size of that unit okay. uh, relative to the whole home. Um, they're normally limited to uh, um, uh, owner-occupied homes. Okay. But the, the, the critical part for, for seniors, Matt, is that they are, they serve a whole variety of evolving needs for seniors aging in place, whether right. it's for uh, needing a caregiver or having um, or sharing multi-generational home with uh, right. uh, yeah, grown don't family. Don't tell my grandson. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> we, we can all think of examples like this. Or renting it for uh, needed income uh, for to pay maintenance and taxes. Um, uh, also of interest uh, for, uh, for uh, families that have a, a handicapped member either a young one or, or a grown one, right. for, for that kind of a, a, a caregiver. Absolutely. So a whole range of needs. Yeah, and it doesn't restrict those. It's all, uh, any of those or any, any kind of need, it just uh, defines the accessory dwelling itself. You're, right? you're allowed to, to meet all those needs. Right. And um, one thing I might add, um, when we talk about affordable housing, uh, people ask, what, what is it? And right. And um, I refer to it as affordable housing with a capital A and then affordable housing with a small a. That, by that I mean, um, th with a capital A, it means affordable housing under some form of a subsidized program where when you create that housing, it's counted on an inventory of affordable housing. Okay. And it's, um, it, it rents or sells for below the market. And the other critical part is it, it's it, the only people who are permitted to benefit from that are people who, who need it, who have okay. no more than a certain income level. The, the reason I mentioned that in relation to the accessory dwelling units is that's affordable housing with a small a. It's right. not officially right. legally restricted. It just makes things more, it makes the house you live in more affordable exactly. because you can do more with it. And, and instead of being alone in a very large house with no help, et cetera, or the help that comes in can't live there or family can't join you. So that gives you those opportunities. So in that sense, it's affordable. It makes things more affordable and, for and, everybody involved. And there's a relationship of some sort, <laughs> right. even if it's with a renter, that level of the rent, right. even though no government program is telling the owner they, they have to rent it, it, it's almost always less than a, a, a similar sized apartment if it were in a commercial apartment building. And this in no way relates to like using that for Airbnb or something. That's Actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's another issue coming, but uh, for, 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 uh, for accessory dwelling units, right. there's a very strict uh, prohibition against that okay. because that's actually not housing for housing needs. It's more of a commercial activity. Okay, yeah, man, that sounds reasonable. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we have, um, we can move right into it if you'd like, but yep. uh, I know you have a number of slides that you can get yep. into. And after that, if we can, uh, if we have a little time, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about what's happening in town. Absolutely. Uh, but let's, let's understand more first, including okay. me. Do you mind if I, I ask questions along the way? No, please do. Okay. And um, this, uh, this slideshow is more about how we, how we get things done in affordable housing and some, some examples of, of uh, 
different types of uh, affordable housing developments that we've done. I, when we finish, we'll, we'll maybe take a look together at where we're going from here. Okay, great. That yeah. sounds good. Uh, so, um, the, I think a good place to start is how the, how the town has structured the whole um, uh, effort for, for affordable housing, how, it's, how we're organized. And this goes back over, over 30 years when the town created a, um, um, a I call it a regime, a, a three-pronged regime that, that is intended to work in sync. Right. And um, the first of these is inclusionary zoning, which uh, requires when a certain type of uh, a size of uh, multifamily development is proposed that um, there's, a, there's a component of that that has to be affordable. And I mean that with the capital A, officially affordable. Right. And we'll come back to that in a so minute. So the officially yeah. affordable, the one thing that I know I always used to have as a question, <coughs> and finally got answered, I think you answered it actually <laughs> at one point, but is <coughs> when a house is affordable, for whatever reason, it's subsidized, et cetera, and it's at a certain price, either board or rental, the next person renting it and the next person buying it stays within those restrictions of some sort, right? It stays affordable. That's right. Um, and these days we, we talk about permanent affordable housing and that's done through what's called a deed, a deed restriction. Okay. And um, that is as long as, al as allowable by law, which is an awfully right. long time. Right. And whenever the affordable unit which, uh, which we find the occupant for initially right. qualified. If that's sold or re-rented, resold, right. uh, it, it has to come back uh, under that restriction for a new qualified owner. Great, that helps So me no one can game the system. Yeah, that's, that's, that helps <laughs> me a lot. Actually, <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. So the, um, the second part of our, of our I'll call three-legged affordable housing stool right. is um, an affordable housing trust fund. And uh, Brookline, um, since this goes back over 30 years, was one of the first municipalities to uh, to adopt a trust fund, and that that uh, in 2020 that. has many many uh, cities and towns have these trust okay. funds now. Um, and then the third, uh, which we spoke about briefly, is the housing advisory board, which right. was created at the same time. And uh, I mentioned these working of a piece. Uh, right. So the uh, the housing advisory board. Um, has three responsibilities, and the first is to oversee and, um, in some cases, negotiate all of the inclusionary zoning um, arrangements that are made within multifamily, okay. new multifamily projects. The second is, I mentioned the Housing Trust Fund. Right. Um, by no coincidence, that the, money, right? the affordable <laughs> housing me the, the ha members are the trustees okay. of, the, of the trust fund, and that's, that's the money. Right. Um, that makes sense. And then, and then the third um, uh, uh, responsibility of the HAB is to develop uh, affordable housing policies and goals and to advise the select board and others when we're right. asked uh, about um, housing and affordable housing. Great. And the public. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> if the public wants advice, sure. <laughs> um, so just a quick... Um, few words about the Housing Advisory Board itself. Right. It, has, it has seven members. This was all under a very specific bylaw. Right. Um, and it included um, a, a requirement of, uh, when we are appointed um, that, that uh, amongst the seven of us that we have certain specific skills uh, and experience. Five of the seven um, uh, HAB members are appointed by the Board of Selectmen. Okay. And I'm putting them up on the slide here. I'll right. get to five of them. Oh yeah, I um, know some of those names. I've seen them. Right, and yeah. and um, uh, they're, they're it's it's a terrific board uh, in terms of not the, the people's skills and experience right. and and um, and and their as you can see their experience. Um, we're expected to have legal, uh, planning, development, and finance uh, right. experience, and also design and architect, which you'll s architecture, which you'll see in a minute. Uh, and then we also are required to have uh, on our board at all times one uh, low or moderate income renter. And- uh, That's a very good idea. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and yeah. at, at the moment, we've got Rita McNally for those many times. She doesn't happen to also her. be an older adult, does she? Yeah, uh, she, I'll let her, I'll let, I'll, I'll let her self-describe, <laughs> but um, uh, she, yes, Rita's a senior as well. Um, and then- um, That's not required, obviously, but- the 
That, no, it's actually it's not. But but as long as I've been involved, uh, that that position um, has always been a seat. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Then there's two um, remaining seats that are designated in the bylaw that that actually cause us to work with two other critical boards and commissions. Um, the um, the planning board right. has to always have a designated member, and that's uh, currently the Makes sense. chair. And, and Steve Hyken brings uh, architectural and design experience. And then the Brookline Housing Authority right. um, also is designated their chair right. for us. Uh, Mike Jacobs is an expert on affordable housing programs. Right. Um, so I'm so just move to in inclusionary zoning for a minute. As I mentioned, the, the inclusionary zoning bylaw requires that um, um, multifamily Good, proposed projects <laughs> uh, uh, have a required affordable housing. Um, I'll use the word contribution advisedly. It's it's a requirement, but right. It's, uh, and if the project is um, a, a, a larger scope, mo uh, at present more than 15 units, the requirement is that 15 percent of uh, those affordable units subject to income limits uh, right. have to be within the project. So if it's a 20 unit project, 15 percent, it would three of those 20 units would have to be right. in the project. Right. Now I am pushing the right button. Um, smaller projects, six to 15 units, um, uh, give the developer the option of uh, paying a cash payment into our housing trust fund. And that's a major okay. source of Okay. Funds, and I'll that's show you in a minute <laughs> how we how we use the money. But that's right. one way. It, that's one source. One way it comes right. in, right. right? And on large projects, right. um, uh, such as one a, a large one that's about to break ground next year in Coolidge Corner, known as Waldo Durgan. Oh yeah. Um, we that, had someone on that described that, by the way. We had the uh, um, EDAB. Paul Sainer. Right. 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 We work very closely together as we do on other things with EDAB sure. because uh, mixed use development is a, is a big deal and a big right. opportunity for both of us. Um, the, the town in those cases uh, where they're more complex uh, usually is, uh, does a, a, a negotiation right. and that's allowed by sure. the bylaw. <clears throat> uh, very quickly, uh, the inclusionary zoning has produced um, uh, over 100 affordable units. Right. Uh, in more than 20 projects. And I'll just, just go through these real quickly. Sure. Uh, we've done um, 51 affordable condominium units in 13 different projects, 21 uh, rental units in seven projects, uh, 17 assisted living units in one project, and that, that's Goddard House for yep. viewers that are familiar Absolutely. with it. Absolutely, right. Um, and 15 affordable, w what's known as SRO, or single room occupancy oh. units, which is, um, Individual units for um, what are known as the, the working poor, folks that you know want work in Brookline in, in, in restaurants and, and, and retail establishments, for example. Are these micro uh, units? Or? Well, they're they're not. They're very small. They used to be called rooming houses. Right. Um, and these days, um, and I'll show you one shortly. Uh, we call them enhanced uh, lodging house units because now they have uh, little little cooking facilities. Right. That in was the, my in next question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can I cook? Can you? Yes. Not me. Yes. Can someone cook? Yep. Uh, coming in 2020, a, right. a, a little bit of a look here. Um, we are uh, ab about to uh, bring to this coming town meeting um, uh, a bylaw which will authorize the uh, increasing of our fee schedule that I mentioned for, yes, the, right. for the 60 to 15 units. And there will be um, an increase of opportunity there. Uh, and we're going to expand the, the range of, of projects. And also, uh, we're going to have a little expansion of the definition of affordable. Um, I mentioned income limits, right. and there's um, there's an area of housing that's now called workforce housing, which is a little bit above the oh, traditional limits. Um, Brookline is, is actually quite unaffordable, as as, right. as you know, right. and um, there's a huge gap between the traditional l income limits of affordability and what somebody would have to pay on the open market. And so we're trying to address that with another uh, little range above the normal income range okay. for So this is creating housing. housing that's priced for people with all income, with, uh, with middle incomes or whatever. Yeah. That are yeah. Uh, ordinarily and, and, and would not look at, uh, or would not like what they got at Brookline. If right. Were, and you, you, you said, nice you said middle income, and right. that's a good that's a good way to, to describe it, or yeah. we call upper moderate income. Right. Um, and that's that's what it's for. Right. Um, 
So uh, on the on the investment side, um, we've we've taken in f fourteen million, roughly, uh, in, into the housing trust. Okay. A little a little under seven million of that has come from the housing developers that with the that fee schedule. Right. That I mentioned. The, the fee schedules, right? Right. right. Um, and that's come from uh, seventeen different projects over the years. Okay. Uh, the town has a formula um, where uh, they make an annual, con a, a usually annual contribution from what's called free cash. Uh, it's a technical term in the, in the budget, um, where if there's some <laughs> surplus, uh, that I use that word advisedly, uh, the, the, the trust fund is in line to get okay, a, so that a, money's a contribution. <laughs> yes, oh, and um, that th yeah. this year, for example, it's, um, uh, there, there should be about seven hundred thousand dollars uh, okay. coming in from that. Over the years, um, we've gotten fourteen payments for just under five million dollars. Uh, less than a million from one-time sale of a foreclosed property, and then interest on the fund, which uh, presently has about three and a half million dollars in it, uh, of about a million and a half dollars. Uh, uh, what, what the house, housing trust fund does, and it's quite a, a variety of, of, uh, of activities. Um, we help um, nonprofit developers and also now the Brookline Housing Authority uh, with what's called pre-development financing. It, it's, it's very expensive to, to do the architectural work and the engineering oh, sure. and the environmental. Oh, yeah. um, and that's before you go to a bank for right. a construction loan. So right. our trust fund actually kind of tees these projects up for right. money that's pretty difficult for, for those folks to get right. uh, nice. otherwise. And then. Um, Th those um, uh, developers bring, they're, they're experts at bringing state and federal subsidies to the table. Um, it's very difficult for them to do affordable housing in Brookline because our land is so, so expensive. Sure. Um, can we go up? Yeah, oh, nothing but up. We, <laughs> we can, we're trying to, yes, and that's, uh, that's a big uh, challenge for the future. Um, so we use the trust fund to, to bring what we call the last dollar to the table. The sponsors come to us with a, with a plan, uh, a, a conceptual scheme and a budget, and they tell us here's what we need to, to make this work. And, okay. and that's how we make things work. Um, and um, so the bottom line on, on the way the trust fund works in terms of investing uh, it, it, an easy way to look at it, although it's not easy, is um, th these days it costs about about a half a million dollars for one affordable unit to be produced in Brookline. The difference between if, if it was a profitable market unit and affordable to limited income folks. So our challenge is where does that half million dollars come from? These development sponsors come w to, to the point where on average we, we've been able to put in $50,000, or about one-tenth of that gap, to make these projects work. And they bring the other. Right. Various ways. Right. right. And we call that leverage. Right. Um, I'm, I'm going to, um, I'm just going to go through very quickly uh, a, 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 a show, a little show and tell on the projects. Great. That that's done. what I was looking and, for. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to race through <laughs> this so we can talk you. about some other yeah, things. Yeah, I was just going to ask you. Uh, you're looking on the screen now at seven projects with the amount of um, trust fund money that we've given for each, right. um, and uh, totaling up around $11 million. Um, and without dwelling on this particular slide, other than that being a summary, I'm right. just going to jump the, to, the, to each of those seven projects and give you a little idea of the, the range of, of, of how the, the fund has been used. Um, at 100 Center Street, uh, right. Hebrew Senior Life, um, uh, had a um, project that was actually um, only affordable for the term of its federal mortgage, and then it was all going to be going up to full market rate. That we put in a million dollars into that project and saved or preserved over 100 uh, affordable units for uh, perpetuity, really. That, that's good to hear, actually. Yeah, and, it's, and it's, it still is. Um, at St. Aidan's, which most people right. will be familiar with, we right. worked with a nonprofit sponsor, uh, the Planning Office for Urban Affairs, when the St. Aidan's um, church closed. I, sure, I remember. Uh, the, their nonprofit affiliate um, came to the table. Yeah. And, um, I remember the headlines. <laughs> that was the many years in, many years in coming, <laughs> and a big, big investment for the town. And um, we produced uh, 36 out of 59 units there, affordable. Right. 
um, 20 of them affordable condo and 16 affordable owner. And then Oh, the, I didn't, okay. Yeah, that was an interesting, um, unique very, mix. And right. then the, re the church remained the, uh, the market rate units. Yeah, right. And we, um, we worked with the preservation folks to preserve a beautiful copper beech tree, which yep. you can see in the slide. Uh, um, and, uh, the I walk past it a lot. Yes, it's, uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a, lot, a, lot to, uh, a lot of interests in making yeah. these, these happen. Up on Fisher Hill, Olmstead Hill was a town-owned underground reservoir. Um, and again, um, the, to make it work, the town sold off market rate lots for McMansions, which you can see on the left in this right. slide. And uh, what we think is a very attractive, affordable housing uh, uh, development on the right, uh, yeah. meant to look like an old mansion. Uh, we got 24 yeah, affordable units condominiums I've seen in that, in that yes. building. The building yeah. you're looking at in the slide. 24 in there. There's, there's um, 14 in that one, and then six and four in two smaller buildings. Yep. Um, at the other far end of, of town, uh, down by the Egmont Street um, BHA properties. Oh, sure. Um, the BHA sponsored this uh, low income, very low income rental property, uh, 32 uh, rental housing units on what was just a parking lot. Right. And just to, to dramatize the need, uh, uh, for these 32 units there was a lottery and there were 2,200 qualified applicants for 32 yeah, that's, units. That, I'm sorry that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, yeah. It's, okay. um, it shows what we, what we need to yeah. do. It's why um, we have this show. <laughs> I mentioned I mentioned SROs or yeah. lodge, the single room occupancy. Right. Uh, this it's was going to be standing room only, but that's all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, near JFK's birthplace uh, on Beale Street, we did um, a, um, a a tired old lodging house that was going to get turned into luxury right. housing. Right. Yes, I do. Uh, remember. We we partnered with the Pine Street Inn sponsor, and yeah. this this property was was gutted and converted into uh, 30, 31 thirty one affordable. Um, you know, the rooms with yeah. little kitchens and, and common social space. Oh, that's great. Uh, and we think it's pretty good looking. Yeah, it is. I walked past looking for it and I couldn't tell which was it. <laughs> with the mansion. It's, I think it's the best right. looking property on the, yeah, really on the nice. street. Yeah, it's yeah. um, And um, uh, um, oh, what's now known as Two Life Communities, it used to be Jewish community housing for the elderly, right. for, for folks walking uh, on Harvard at JFK Crossing. Right. Um, this was, um, Part of the uh, I knew their Brighton Israel, facility. Israel, right on the corner. Yeah, I saw their Brighton facility. But, uh, and you can see it's under construction now. 62 um, uh, mixed income, uh, all affordable uh, units will be will be coming on the market. Uh, yeah, that's great. There, um, we're working with the Brookline Housing Authority. They're do, uh, renovating a series of their properties, uh, mostly uh, uh, senior housing. Right. Um, uh, 91, this uh, this one that we're doing at um, 90 Longwood, I know, right. but we've done the um, the O'Shea House and there'll the be the O'Shea. That's the one. There'll be several more. On 91 Park or something like that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, most of it's uh, See, uh, upgrading, something. but some of it's new housing. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, uh, there's a there's a uh, town-owned parking lot in Brookline Village. Yes, where we're, right, we're, right. We're doing another experiment, which is um, we've invited um, after a years of process. Um, right. um, prospective uh, senior housing developers to propose building yes. senior affordable housing over the parking lot. And, I remember and the day the my, a friend of mine, Henry Winkleman, came in and said, why don't they build over parking lots? And I said, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, he came to the senior center about five years ago with that five idea. Five years ago, yeah. 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 And he deserves ago. a lot of credit for, yeah. for uh, keeping us on, keep the, being on going, track. Yeah, just yeah. keep asking, keep yep. going. So, um, uh, that has gone through a whole series of, uh, of stages here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through this because I know we're limited on time. We are. Um, we, we have, have two qualified that. applicants right. for that, and we're about to select a, a developer. Great. And the trust fund is going to be needed to make that project work. Um, yeah. We're finally. In, we're, we're just about. Newbury, yeah. Yeah. Coming to the end. Don't worry about that. Okay. <laughs> um, you're, you're seeing the um, the, the no smaller project. part of Newbury campus. <laughs> yes. Um, and we are working with the uh, development and negotiating team up there to uh, bring um, a, a a nice proposal for a town meeting to consider. Yes. Maybe we'll bring that back when yeah we actually have that ready to to go. I would love to hear what they're doing. Yeah, that's that's a lot more detail. But I we'll think that's a whole. Day. Uh, yeah. yeah, but I think that would not, I would love to have you. Uh, um, back and discuss that actually, because it's interesting to watch it happening. 
we're, we're very excited about that, and we're going to bring a, uh, an actually a choice for town meeting to choose what, what they want. And we also have uh, a forum coming, I believe? Yes, yes. Um, yes. On March 29th, right. um, and this has to do with uh, looking at the future, Right. Um, uh, there will be a forum at the Runkle School at okay. 6 p.m., jointly sponsored by the Committee for Dis Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations, right. and the HAB. Great. Um, yeah, so diversity comes in this actually a lot, but we'll get that to another show, too. It, it's a major right, uh, part of the goal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you, Roger. My pleasure. Uh, <laughs> I can keep going, <laughs> to tell you the yeah. truth, but we have to stop. Um, thank you. Remember, this will be rebroadcast over the next few weeks, and it'll also be on the website for Brookline Can and on the Facebook and Twitter accounts for Brookline Can also. Thanks for watching. Thank you.